Hi everyone, welcome to a midweek refuel here on the cusp of Independence Day weekend. Sorry that I'm coming to you a little bit later than I normally do. That's usually a seven o'clock item, but uh, here we are at uh, 8.15, 8.20. Uh, it's just been a remarkably long day. It's been a remarkably good day. Uh, we had vacation Bible school at St. Paul's. This is uh, something that uh, weekly we have, uh, I'm sorry, yearly, we have a great week of kids. And this year, God has blessed us with more kids than we've had in a while. Uh, and it's also a wonderful time of praise. It's a great time with the staff. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't been a part of a vacation Bible school, come on down to St. Paul's tomorrow morning or Friday morning, anywhere between 9 o'clock and about 1230. It's a really a sight to behold and a lot of joy. And so it's one of my very favorite weeks of the church year. And uh, I hope that uh, it has been a blessing. This year, our theme is monumental, and it's taken us out to the desert southwest at Monument Valley and some of the flora and fauna that you'll find out there. Uh, but in all of these things, what we've been looking at is how God is very awesome uh, and how he is very faithful. And we've been looking at the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis. I'm so thankful to everybody that's been putting Vacation Bible School together. I'm thankful for the families that are there, uh, and I'm thankful for the way the congregation has supported it. This is just really a great time of uh, praise and, and growth in God. And so, again, if you haven't ever seen Vacation Bible School, why don't you come on down tomorrow or Friday just to see what it's all about. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's, we are here on the cusp of Independence Day weekend. It's become known as Fourth of July, uh, but we should uh, pay attention to what's behind it. You know, as Christians and as Americans, we're document-based people. We put our uh, understandings and our faith um, in something that is recorded down. And if you haven't read the Declaration of Independence in a while, maybe you should. It's available online. Maybe you carry a pocket one along with you. It's a good thing to review, and it's a good way, actually, to kind of view what's going on in the world these days and say, boy, we've come a long way uh, since the days of uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Founding Fathers and that whole, um, and that whole time of, uh, of our uh, independence. And so I wanted to uh, read to you part of the document at the end of the Declaration of Independence. And, and listen to this. Uh, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And then it goes on with the signatures of all the folks from the original 13 colonies who then had declared themselves to be these United States of America. It's similar, that last paragraph, that sentence that I read to you, um, what our founding fathers were saying as what we as Christians say today about our creed, pledging our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. In Luther's small catechism that we've been diving into this summer, we're about to turn the page away from the commandments and go to the Apostles' Creed, which Martin Luther said, unless we understand it, we, we can't call ourselves followers of Christ. We can't call ourselves Christians. But what a creed is, is based off of the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And when we say I believe, we can say it about very, very trivial things like I believe that the Yankees are going to win the rest of the season and probably emerge as World Series champs. Do I really believe that or do I just hope that? Or I believe that we're going to be able to take a vacation later on in the month of July. Do I, do I believe that or do I hope that and I'm working towards it? And so I'd like to give you a way of discerning between beliefs and hopes and beliefs and other things, wishes. So think about it this way. What is it that you're willing to stake your life on? That rises to the level of belief. As I mentioned before in other circumstances, Martin Luther not only wrote a small catechism that he gave to the parents of the families in Germany so that they could train up their kids in the way they should go, he also gave to the pastors of Germany 
a large catechism. And in that large catechism, there's a point in talking about the creeds, having a God, is that thing to which you turn in your time of trouble. Uh, I think a little bit about my daughter, Christia, and the way that she goes rock climbing. She straps into a harness and then she ties into a rope that helps her to belay and to be safe as she climbs these walls. And she is putting really her health and her well-being in the strength of these straps and fasteners that go around her torso and her legs and, and the rope that then goes up the wall and, and then back down to someone who is belaying her. That is a belief. It's a trust. And you could argue one way or another if it's a well-placed trust, but it is absolutely, she is relying on that webbing and that harness to keep her safe. She's also putting her trust in the person at the other end of the rope who's going to do their job so that Christia does not fall to her injury or death. So she stakes her life on the belief that all of those parts are going to be in place when she goes up climbing. So what is it that you are willing to stake your life on? For our founding fathers, they were pledging to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And actually for many of them, it cost them those things because as they made this declaration of independence, they were calling down upon themselves the fury of an empire that stretched from sun to sun. Here, many of them did pay with their lives. Many of them did pay with their fortunes. Many of them did pay with their sacred honor. When it comes down to the creed, we say this, I believe in God. He's the Father Almighty. He's the maker of heaven and earth. We're taking a pretty firm stand there. And it goes on to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. And he's our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he sits now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence, from there, he's going to come back, and he's going to judge those who are alive and those who have already died. This is an incredible statement of faith because so much of what I just spoke to you and what was recorded in the creed really is incredible, even to the point of being absurd. Born of the Virgin Mary? Risen from the dead? Returning again? These require faith. And that those events that we just rehearsed from so long ago actually have an impact on you now and here? And you're willing to stake your life on it? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian or Catholic Church. They're interchangeable, and I'll tell you why in a couple of weeks. The communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of my body, <laughs> and the life which goes on forever and ever. More incredible things. Like I mentioned before, we are document-based people, both as Americans and as Christians, and documents consist of words, and one of those words, incredible breaks down to not believable. But the 
thing is, is that these events are so critical that they have to be believed. And we look to these in faith and trust, and we literally stake our life on them. And not only here on this earth, but our eternal life. The creed takes up some weighty measures. Unfortunately, since we've said it so many times, like we do in the Lord's Prayer, it can become rote. But if you slow down and you think through what you're pledging yourselves to, your life, your fortune, your sacred honor, and the upped ante of your eternal destiny, the creed all of a sudden takes on a whole lot of weight and a whole lot of import. And it's not something that should just roll off our tongue. It becomes something where each phrase is worthy of our pondering and worthy of our thought, worthy of our trust. Because what we're doing in the Apostles' Creed is kind of the opposite side of the coin of the Declaration of Independence. It's a Declaration of Dependence. It's saying we are staking our lives not on each other as our Founding Fathers did and the ideas that they had come to hold as valuable we're staking our lives on something that God did for us millennia ago and delivers to us today. When we baptize in his name, when we return to him in confession and absolution, when we call on him in prayer and praise and thanksgiving, when we come to the altar to receive the sacred body and blood of Jesus, You see, it was only on the cross that we saw what true independence from God looks like. And Jesus asked the question, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was all alone. And he was all alone for a reason. For us. So that we could have something to depend on. Not only did Jesus die on the cross, he rose from the grave to demonstrate that God is reliable in his work, that he fulfills his promises, and actually it's God who is willing to pledge his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor for us. Not the other way around. Our declaration of dependence begins with those words, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And they conclude with, and the life everlasting. Amen. For the next three weeks, we're going to be digging into those words. And what I hope that you'll see, and I'm praying that you'll see, is that our dependable God isn't remote or distant or even contained in a dry, dry, dusty old document. That He's the living God. And that by putting our faith in him today, we actually are able to see such blessings as life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. God grant you such a joy in depending on him that it will come as second nature to you today and forever. A couple things uh, before, we be, uh, before we close off with the word of prayer. First, uh, again, my invitation that you come on down to Vacation Bible School. Uh, tomorrow anytime or Friday anytime between 9 and 1230. Hope to see you there. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that uh, we're going to uh, continue with worship at St. Paul's on Saturdays and Sundays. And there's a bit of a time that we've set aside on both days for a deeper dive into the catechism. So on Saturday afternoons, since we worship at 4, we'll gather at 3 o'clock. For that deeper dive, about 45 minutes of time 
just getting back into the words of the Catechism. For some of you, it may have been a really long time since you've picked up that document again. So we're going to dust it off and dig in. Uh, on Sunday mornings, that study comes after worship. So since we worship on Sundays at 10, sometime just after 11 o'clock and we've gathered some, some fellowship time and some coffee and pastries and things like this out in the narthex, we'll come back into church and we'll spend that 45 minutes digging in starting uh, around 11, say 11.15 or so. So I hope to see you at church. I hope to see you in person. It's great that we're able to connect out here in virtual land, but uh, live is so much better than Memorex. Uh, it's been a great day today. Not only did we have Vacation Bible School, I was also able to pay a pastoral care visit to my dear sister in Christ, Ethel Lesh. Ethel, God's blessings to you over there in Cambridge and also to my sister in Christ, Sue Grigger, up in Hudson Falls. Uh, they are so appreciative of the way that the congregation reaches out, and uh, they express that to me. And so I wanted to express it also to the congregation and to say thanks for acting like the body of Christ to people that can't come to St. Paul's in person. But if you can, boy, it would be great to see you. So, my dear friends in Christ, God's blessings to you. Stake your life. You can depend on what Jesus has done for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for pledging your life, and not just pledging it, but giving it, your fortune, laying aside all of the treasures of heaven, especially your Father's love and your place at his right hand, and your sacred honor where you endured the curse and the separation from the Father on our behalf. We are st astonished that you would go to such great lengths in order to make us your own. As we as a country celebrate Independence Day and remember some of our history, we ask that you to turn our minds also to our history that gives us identity in you as the body of Christ. And not just our history, but also our future. Because our future informs our present. Lord God, you've called us to be your own. We are moving forward towards blessings that are beyond our imagination that you've prepared for those who've loved you. May both of those truths inform us today so that we may declare our dependence upon you and so dependent draw from you strength and peace and joy for living and serving in your kingdom. We pray these things asking that you'd bind us together as a congregation, that you'd help us reach out and love to the community around us, that according to your all your good grace, we may stand in the world as salt and light as you've called us to be, and allow us, O oh Lord, to see the fruits of our faith, bearing fruit in the lives of others and giving you glory. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, upon whom we depend for our very lives. Amen. I hope it's clear to you that he loves you so much. God's blessings to you tonight. Until next time. See you soon. Bye-bye.